Not far from the M6 motorway in northern Lancashire, you'll find the tiny village of Fernihuff. And in the village is an ancient shrine to Our Lady, dating back to the 11th century. For over a thousand years, the faithful have come here to honor Our Lady and ask for her help in their needs. Even after the Reformation in the 16th century, Catholics continued to come to the shrine of Our Lady of Fernihuff. And today, it's an important center for pilgrimage for the northwest of England. Since the Reformation, Fernihuff has also been the centre of devotion to the many Lancashire martyrs who gave their lives for their faith. Ladywell House, here at the shrine, contains a reliquary and the Burgess Altar, a portable altar used by priests in recusant times. Of these, perhaps the best known, is Saint Edmund Arrowsmith, who ministered to the Catholics of Lancashire for 15 years before being executed for his faith in 1628. I'm here today to tell his story. Edmund Arrowsmith's mother was a member of the Gerard family, who were one of the leading Catholic families in Lancashire. Amongst his family members was the priest John Gerard, who wrote The Diary of an Elizabethan Priest, which gives a detailed picture, very valuable to historians today, of what it was like to be a persecuted priest at that time. Another of the family was Blessed Miles Gerard, a priest who was martyred in 1590, and Edmund's grandfather died in prison for his faith. Marjorie Gerard married Robert Arrowsmith, and their firstborn, the future martyr, was born in 1585. He was christened Brian, but when he was confirmed, he took the name Edmund, after one of his uncles, who was a priest teaching at Dowie. On one occasion, during Edmund's childhood, his parents were arrested for being Catholics and taken to Lancaster jail, leaving Edmund and his brothers and sisters shivering at home until a kindly neighbor took them in. When Edmund's father died, his mother entrusted the young boy to the care of an old priest as his tutor. Edmund was a remarkably devout child. 
On his way to school each day, he recited the little office of Our Lady with his classmates. And on the way home, they said Vespers and Compline together. His own private prayers included the Jesus Psalter, in which Our Lord's name is repeated many times, followed by intercessions about living a dedicated and pure life. Not surprisingly, at the age of 20, Edmund crossed the sea to Dowie to train for the priesthood. After a few delays due to his health problems, he was ordained at the age of 27. And a year after that, he was sent to join the English mission. And he returned to Lancashire, where he worked for the next 12 years. He evidently had a lively personality. He was described as zealous, witty, and fervent and he was enthusiastic about debating religious questions with non-Catholics. We get the impression of St. Edmund as an energetic, hard-working and cheerful person. Here at Ladywell House at Fernyhuff, there is a museum dedicated to all the Lancashire martyrs. It's currently run by priests of the Holy Family Fathers and brothers of the youth from Nigeria, West Africa. I'm meeting Father Ernest Attar to show me round. Father Ernest, thank you so much for having us here. Thank you, Monique. It's my pleasure. And you have a really remarkable uh, collection of relics here, not only from Arrowsmith, but from many, many of the 40 martyrs. Right, yeah. Um, why do you think the 40 martyrs are so important and so special? Oh, they're so special to me, honestly. You know, coming from Nigeria to work in this country, and uh, most of them, I have heard about them, I've read about them, but coming here and seeing some of their relics is quite inspiring, and it makes me to believe that the history of the church is truth. Probably the, the biggest and most spectacular uh, exhibit that you have here is the gorgeous Burgess altar. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. It was done by a man called Thomas Burgess in 1560s. It is made in such a way that it can fold down when it is not being used. So this altar was made by Thomas Burgess. So when people celebrate mass in that family, and there's a report that soldiers are coming in, what they will do is to hide the priest inside this altar and then close it. It will look like a wardrobe. And am I right in thinking that this not only would fold, but it would also move around from house to house to house? It happened, yeah. I think it was moving around. There was a time even it was in Bolton, you know, but eventually here is the last, probably last bus stop <laughs> for it. Yes. But I suppose that that was to spread out the suspicion if too many people would go to a house Often, yeah. people would think, oh, I think they're saying mass in that yes. house. Yes, you're absolutely right. Yes, that was one of the reasons, yeah. And Edmund Arrowsmith, do you think that he used this? Yes, one of the saints that used this was Edmund Arrowsmith, a fantastic saint, well celebrated in this part of Lancashire. So he used it in 1621. Even Edmund Campion used it, but Edmund Campion used it before Arrowsmith. So from 1621, to 1628 when Edmund Arrowsmith was killed, was frequently using this altar. That's incredible to have that link to him as well. Absolutely. One of the things that came into my mind when I looked at the crucifix of Arrowsmith, if this man loved the crucifix so much, he must have disposed himself to die like Christ. Yeah. He must have disposed himself to die like Christ. You know, he was sent to France to study for priesthood. And one of the most inspiring things is that those guys who were sent to France or Spain to study, but they knew they were coming to die. You know, they, were, they were study for priesthood and they would come back and most probably be arrested and quartered. But they did it. And as a priest yourself, to have this legacy of priesthood in this country that, is, that was so strongly persecuted, um, what does that mean for priests like you today? Well, uh, I will probably I will be a little bit negative 
I'm learning it in the sense that you know, when you look at the rate at which vocation, priestly vocation is going down here and how lukewarm many people have become in terms of faith, you feel like, what will Aerosmith, you know, be doing now in heaven? Are you getting the points? Honestly, I feel inspired. I feel inspired. I've chosen my vocation to be vocation of sacrifice and to a very large extent working in a shrine that is dedicated to Lancashire matters has been the greatest thing in my life. Father Ernest, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Monica. I'm, I'm so happy. It's my pleasure. There really are a remarkable connection of relics here. Um, but these are the ones that Father Ernest was talking about uh, that pertain to Edmund Arrowsmith. And we can have a closer look at them here. This is his crucifix, which was known as a carrying cross. So this was literally the one that he carried with him on all of his travels during his 15 year ministry. And it's been mounted here onto a silver cross, but the smaller one, the one inside, is the one that would have been his. There's also, very touchingly, some much smaller relics here of bits of cloth. There's two here. It says a piece of cloth which came from Father Arrowsmith. And here's another one that says brindle vestments. There's something very touching about the fact that these tiny scraps of cloth have been kept all these years and passed down just because they're connected with someone like Edmund Arrowsmith. And you see he's next to, he's grouped with some martyrs that you will remember from earlier episodes. We've got St. John Campbell, a small relic from him, St. Cuthbert Main. Here we have St. Edmund Campion, St. Philip Howard, and some others that we haven't covered yet, but you might uh, know coming up. People like Oliver Plunkett, Alban Rowe. Over there we also have Southworth, Margaret Clitheroe, uh, St. Thomas More, St. John Fisher, these other big towering figures from the period. And it's remarkable really because obviously some of them knew each other, but most of them didn't. They were born at completely different times in totally different areas. Someone like Arrowsmith, he would never have met Clitheroe or Campion or Maine or Kemble or any of those. But seeing their relics here grouped together, you do get the sense of them as a group, united by a common cause in the terribly persecuted times that they lived in and of course united by their martyrdom as well. It's really remarkable seeing the Burgess altar up close. If you come down here, this compartment down here is uh, the one that Father Ernest was talking about, where the priest himself would actually have hidden. So when they closed up the altar, where the authorities were coming, he would have been closed in here. Rather terrifying. Enough room for a grown man, but not very much room. It's been changed subsequently, obviously. They've made it a little grotto. There's a beautiful nativity scene in here. And the carvings and paintings inside this altar are really very beautiful. And you can see the importance that they attach to the Eucharist at this time of persecution when they quite often wouldn't have been able to receive it. And the quotation across the top in Latin, tantum valet celebratio misse, quantum mors Christi in cruce. That's a quotation from St. John Chrysostom, and it says, the celebration of the mass is just as important as the death of Christ on the cross. During this period of his life, St. Edmund was left alone by the authorities because by that time, King James I had come to the throne. Not only was he married to a Catholic, but he also spent some time trying to arrange for his son Charles to marry the King of Spain's daughter and so wanted to appear less harsh towards Catholics.
But in 1622, Edmund was arrested. He was brought before the Anglican Bishop of Chester, who happened to be having dinner. It was a Friday, and the bishop, a kindly man, apologised to Edmund that he and his companions were eating meat. Edmund's reply was to ask who had given them dispensation for this. Because of the political situation at the time, Edmund was soon released from prison and was able to continue to work as a priest. But being an ordinary priest wasn't enough for the energetic St. Edmund. And in 1624, he joined the Jesuits, who were known for their disciplined and rigorous lifestyle. He was allowed to do a very shortened novitiate of just a three-month retreat, and then he returned to the mission field. But just four years later, he was betrayed to the authorities by a renegade Catholic who had a grievance against Edmund because he had reproved him for his irregular life. Edmund had been based in this house in the village of Horton near Preston. Today it's known as Arrowsmith House. And it was here, in August 1628, when Edmund was saying what was to be his last mass, that the priest hunters arrived to arrest him. He managed to get out of the house and onto a horse to make a desperate dash for freedom. The priest hunters overtook him on the road and attacked him with swords, but he parried their blows with a stick and spurred his horse to get away. Sadly, at Brindle Moss, when the horse came to a fence, it refused to jump it, and the pursuers caught him. This time, Edmund was imprisoned at Lancaster Castle to await his trial at the Assizes. At his trial, Edmund asked for a debate in which he would defend the Catholic faith as the true religion. The judge refused, perhaps afraid that Edmund's arguments would prove too persuasive for those who would come to watch. Edmund declared that in that case, he would defend the Catholic faith with his blood. The judge replied, I will not leave this town before I see your bowels burned before your face a reference to the horrific procedure of hanging, drawing and quartering which awaited Edmund. The judge continued to try to scare him, saying repeatedly, you shall die. Edmund replied, and you too, my lord, must die. When the judge finally passed the death sentence, Edmund knelt down, bowed his head and said, Deo gratias, thanks be to God. Also imprisoned in Lancaster Castle was another priest, soon to be a martyr, St. John Southworth. He and Edmund had been able to communicate with each other and had arranged that each would give absolution to whoever was led out to death first and that they would give a signal to the other. So, on the day of Edmund's execution, 
as he was being led through the castle courtyard, Southworth was waiting at his cell window. Edmund raised his hands, giving the signal, and just as in confession today, Southworth gave him absolution, saying, Ego te absolvo a peccatis tuis in nomine patri et filio et spiritu sancto. Amen. I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Edmund was dragged a quarter of a mile to the gibbet that had been prepared for his execution. As he stood on the ladder, he was allowed to speak to the crowd. His words were recorded by a Catholic in the crowd, words which we can feel addressed to us today too. Bear witness, you who have come to see my end, that I die a constant Roman Catholic. And for Jesus Christ's sake, let not my death be a hindrance to your well-doing and going forward in the Catholic religion, but rather may it encourage you thereto. For Jesus Christ's sake, have a care of your soul, than which nothing is more precious, and become members of the true church as you tender your salvation. For hereafter, that alone will do you good. Even after this strong profession of faith, a Protestant minister still tried to get Edmund to change his mind, shouting up to him that even now, a judge would spare his life if he would give in. You will live if you conform to the Protestant religion. Edmund's reply was clear. Oh, sir, how far I am from that. Tempt me no more. I am a dying man. I will do it in no case, under no condition. And he addressed the sheriff and his men, saying, the time will come when far from repenting your return to the Catholic Church, you will find it your greatest comfort and advantage. Then he was hanged and butchered in the usual way. There is another, even more direct relic of this great and holy martyr. After his death, St. Edmund's body was dismembered, but Catholics managed to obtain one of his hands. It has been continuously venerated as a relic of this holy man, and is today housed in a shrine in this church of St. Oswald in Ashton in Makerfield, in Edmund's beloved Lancashire, where it is known as the Holy Hand. As St. Edmund was dying at the hands of the executioner, he gasped out to our Lord, to whom he had been so devoted his whole life, Bonne Jesu, good Jesus. Profound expression of faith and love. Jesus was indeed St. Edmund's good, his love, his savior, to whom he dedicated his life and finally his death.
Are you searching for purpose of life? Discover your true identity. Stay tuned to Shalom World.